Hello, Robert Bastian here with a conversation about RCPD, retrograde cricopharyngeus dysfunction, and the workup. How do we prove that's what a person has? And I've been wanting to do this video for a long time, but uh, it is a kind of complicated subject and, and it takes a lot of time to prepare uh, a complicated discussion in a detailed way. And so I decided, okay, you'll just have to put up with a kind of conversational approach to this. And uh, I think we'll try to make a, an index so that you can skip from point to point in the discussion if I get a little long-winded. So uh, why talk about the workup? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, it came to my attention recently that uh, a, a GI colleague, not in my hospital system but elsewhere, had expressed exasperation with our work here at Bastion Voice Institute, saying, but they don't measure anything. And uh, I also get contacted by patients from time to time who come here because they say, I found a place that would, would help me, but they said they needed to do test one, two, three, four, and five before they would do the Botox injection. And I came to you because you don't require any testing. And so I, I thought, uh, understanding and, and sort of affirming the idea that others won't agree with this thought process that I'm going to take you through. Uh, still, I want to just say, why is it that we don't do a lot of testing for this disorder? Um, well, one is, what have we learned from nearly 1,500 patients in our caseload here uh, who have undergone a lot of testing? What have we learned? Well, uh, I would say and by the way, we're at 50 states and I think we're still at 22 countries. Uh, if we were to add up all the tests that people have done before they came to us, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was six or 8,000 tests. Things like barium swallows, esophagoscopy, you know, upper GI scope, uh, stomach emptying studies, manometry, uh, stool cultures, CAT scans, um, everything under the sun. And what have we learned? What did those people get out of doing all those tests? Did they get any ex a diagnosis? The answer is zero. Not one person got the diagnosis. Now, it could be somewhere else, elsewhere. There is a patient who underwent some kind of test and they did get the diagnosis. But our caseload, not one yet. Well, what did they get? They didn't get any diagnosis. They got nowhere, but what they did get something out of all that testing. They got a lot of consumption of their time. They got putting up with some discomforts and, uh, you know, tests are not always pleasant. They got uh, sort of impoverishment. I don't mean literal, but I mean they spent a lot of money for their co-pays and such. Uh, and they got frustration, they got maybe even a little skepticism, maybe even a little uh, hostility because they did everything they were asked to do and they got absolutely nothing out of it. So that's what we get out of the sort of testing regime for RCPD. Well, what did we get out of the a match to the syndrome? The big four, can't burp, gurgling, bloating, and flatulence. Uh, can't burp doesn't mean don't ever burp, but it means that you can't burp other than micro burps. You can't burp at all, or maybe you have a few mi micro burps per month or per year, um, but you can't harness them and you are very aware you need to burp and, and can't burp sufficiently. So that's one. And by the way, infancy is excluded. They're almost always lifelong. And when we use the word lifelong, we exclude infancy because two out of three with RCPD did burp as infants. And so we're talking about lifelong as being to the memory of the patient. Um, now, they may say I uh, developed the problem when I was nine or six or 16 or whatever. But what they're really saying is I developed an awareness when you ask those people, well, were you able to burp before that, they typically say, no, I, I, my friends could burp the alphabet, I never could figure out how to do that, things like that. So, uh, can't burp gurgling. Gurgling is 
quiet and internal in some most people it's audible at least a couple of feet away very often six or ten or across a big room um, it's louder when they open their mouths and it's not so much a hunger pain growling stomach kind of thing but it's kind of a, a gurgling up in this area louder if they open their mouths so can't burp gurgling bloating is mostly abdominal but there's quite a few people who have some chest pressure and some low neck discomfort. Sometimes that's almost harder to bear than the abdominal distress. Abdominal distress is by far more universal, but um, it's really a sort of pressure sensation, abdomen, chest, neck, uh, and then flatulence. There are a few people who aren't that aware of flatulence. They say, I'm not sure what's a normal amount. And some of them, I think, are deflating through the night, and so they're not that aware of it. But uh, the vast majority of people say, oh my goodness, the flatulence is crazy. It's gold medal. It's world class. I don't know anybody with as much flatulence as I have. So people uh, match three out of four of those, usually all four of them. There's a whole list of sub-symptoms that are bad and common, but not as universal. It's hypersalivation. It's uh, nausea after eating. It's uh, that mechanical shortness of breath feeling that I can't Phil, I, I, there's just nowhere to put the air. Uh, I couldn't possibly go for a run kind of feeling. Uh, and even constipation uh, can be, there are even people who get rapid heartbeat and flushing because of the parasympathetic, sympathetic uh, involvement, I think, in the mediastinum. So uh, all of those things make a picture in most people that's very clear. And it's all related to can't, uh, inability to burp. Well, um, by the way, manometry can show the diagnosis, but you have to know what the diagnosis is so that you uh, tailor the manometry to really focus on the upper esophageal sphincter. There's a very nice study from Holland in eight people, and I would just point out they already knew those eight people had RCPD, and they were able to show the hypertonicity of the upper esophageal sphincter with high pressure in the esophagus created by carbonation. Um, so they, they, put, uh, they put respectability on the diagnosis. But my point is the manometry showed that they couldn't burp, but the patient could tell them they couldn't burp. So why exactly do we need manometry in, a, in the clinical setting? Well, there's another reason that I am sort of not that interested in, I mean, I'm interested in testing. I love testing, and I, I think it's very important. If people want to publish papers, they should definitely do testing. But, um, you know, I, I think you can understand what, it's not that we're shallow uh, or that we're half-baked. We're very thoughtful and we're very, uh, you know, detailed in our approach to these patients, but we just don't see the point of doing a lot of testing uh, for the reasons I've already mentioned. Well, one of the things I've said is <clears throat> it to patients, if they are in a clinic where they say, yes, we'll do this for you, but we want to do all these tests, uh, you, I, I sort of facetiously say, well, say to the doctor, thank you very much. Can you give me the list of the tests and let me write them down? And then you look at the list and you say, great, this looks like a nice list of tests. Do you mind if we start with Botox? Uh, in, in other words, that's a test. It's a diagnostic test, very strong diagnostic test. It's the best one in my view. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of winking as I say that, but um, there's a strategic uh, element that you could harness in order to to avoid all the testing. Uh, there's another reason that I am wanting to minimize testing in this group uh, is frugality. Now I'm a person who believes in that people are worth spending a lot of money on. I have a patient who's a pharmacist and he told me about a brand new treatment and the treatment course is going to be a million dollars. But he explained that if you don't spend that million dollars, then the disability and the suffering and the end of life care is going to cost three or four million dollars. So, you know, a million dollar treatment is a bargain in that case. 
But human beings are worth spending a lot of money on. But on the other hand, I am a little bothered by just spending money without uh, return. So there's a frugality uh, issue here for me. And in fact, we've made our uh, costs here as simple as we can. And I think our total cost is about $3,600. That's everything from first meeting, discussion, consultation, our office examination, the anesthesiologist, the facility charge, the Botox, everything together is about $3,600. Now this is uh, August of 2023, so I'm sure those costs are going to change. But right now, that's approximately what our costs are. And of course, if we do it via EMG here in the office, cost is much less, uh, under half of that cost. Um, so anyway, there's a little uh, part of me that hates to spend money that I don't think I'm getting something back from. I'm also interested in limiting testing for that. I'm circling back to that concept of medical jadedness, that we beat patients up by doing all kinds of testing that doesn't get much for them. Um, the other thing I would just mention, just for, for those of you who are, are sufferers with this disorder, is just to understand something about medicine. Medicine doctors tend, I would say, I don't know this, but I would say based on all of my interactions with many, many doctors in my profession, that doctors tend towards what we call high fact finder. Uh, it's a Colby, K-O-L-B-E, uh, description of how people deal with information. So there's a continuum. There's high fact finder and there's low fact finder. Uh, high fact finders are people who are granular. It's they want to know more. The question is always, tell me more. Uh, low fact finder people are a little bit resistant to uh, detail that they don't think is important. They shed what they consider to be irrelevant detail. They're not shallow. They're not people who can't deal with detail. They can deal with detail fine. They just are a little bit impatient with detail that they think is ex extraneous or unneeded. Um, they're interested in the framework. They want to establish the headline. That, you know, they're, they're interested in the bottom line. They're better, by the way, at, at running complex organizations because they don't get bogged down in detail. So there's a value to being low fact finder. It's not a criticism to say, oh, he's low fact finder. I happen to be a bit on the low fact finder side. Uh, I can deal with endless detail if I need to, if I think it's important, but I kind of want to get past what I don't think is, is that important. But a lot of doctors are very high five fact finder. And so you just have to understand who you're working with. Well, there is my discussion, uh, a little bit rambling, a little bit conversational. And I just wanted to get it out finally to, un to explain why is it that we are a little bit uh, uninterested in testing. Again, happy for you to, to do it. If you are a high fact finder person and you want to do it, great, go for it. Uh, if, you're, if your doctor is doing a study, totally on for it. I, I want there to be studies and, and diagrams and graphs and numbers and tables and all, the more the merrier. Uh, publication, you need measurement these days because editorial boards are not very open to observational uh, articles. Um, so uh, hopefully this is just a conversation and other people will disagree and um, I'm all for it. I want everyone to think what they want to think, but now you know what I think. Thanks for listening.